So let's start from the communicative view of language. That is the idea that language is nothing but a conduit for thought. And, and, and one intuition at the basis of this idea is in the words of Lila Gleitman and Anna Papafragu, is that thought is rich, but language is sketchy or ambiguous. Let me give you some examples that they make. Uh, take homonyms. So these are words that uh, have the same spelling, but are associated with different meanings. Imagine I were to tell you, oh, I can see a crane in the distance. Now, the, the, ling the, the sentence I'm speaking is highly ambiguous because you don't know if I am seeing a bird in the distance or if I'm seeing a giant piece of machinery for construction in the distance. So my language is sketchy in the sense it's ambiguous to you what it is exactly that I'm trying to convey. But in my mind, there's no ambiguity about what I'm seeing. I'm either seeing a bird or I'm seeing a piece of, um, of equipment, right? There's no, um, there's, no, there's no place for ambiguity in my mind as to what I am seeing. I know exactly what I'm seeing. But the way in which my thought became language somehow generated ambiguity. And so the intuition is if language and thought were the same thing, how is it that a very clear thought becomes a very ambiguous sentence? Another example of this is context dependent. Uh, context dependence. There are several um, um, there are several linguistic expressions which need context in order to be interpreted correctly. Um, imagine I were to say, "Well, now is a good time." You know what I mean by now is something extremely precise. I mean um, Saturday, ten forty-two a.m. That's what I mean. Uh, but but of course you might not know that. In fact, if Napoleon um, were to say or had ever said, uh, "Now is a great time for France to be a great country," something like that. Well, his now probably meant somewhere in the early eighteen hundreds. Now, when I said now, I'm thinking something very specific. And so did Napoleon. But unless you have context, which allows you to disambiguate what now means, it's an extremely ambiguous, uh, it's an extremely ambiguous expression. Um, similarly, um, many expressions, um, some words just fail to convey information that the speaker intends to convey. For example, if I were to say, oh, um, I was talking um, to my uncle yesterday. Now, when I say that, I'm thinking a very specific person. But to you, that might not be clear because you don't know which uncle I'm talking about. Maybe I have multiple uncles on either side of my family. I have paternal uncles, I have maternal uncles. So to you, it's extremely ambiguous. So my very specific thought about one very specific person again, turned into a very ambiguous message. How is it that a very specific, a very crisp thought about me interacting with a very specific person, when it turns into language, turns into a very ambiguous statement? How could it be if language and thought were the same, why would suddenly a very crisp thought become a very ambiguous sentence? And finally, in the words of the Mad Hatter, uh, while people often mean what they say, they do not, and they could not exactly say what they mean. See, the idea is that really what matters is successful communication. Um, take this other famous example um, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of a waitress saying, the ham sandwich wants his check. Now, obviously, um, this sounds like a crazy expression, but we all understand what it means. The person who ordered a ham sandwich would like to have their check. So see, this is a beautiful example of how communication is really a continuous negotiation between a speaker and, and, a, and a listener about how much context as a speaker I need to provide and how much context you as a listener can already extract from the circumstance. And according to this, we use extremely underspecified extremely ambiguous expressions very often. And all these examples that I gave you are not marginal examples in language. These are sentences we use all the time. So in this sense, 
point that Gleitman and Papa Frag were making is that language is a relatively impoverished and ambiguous and underspecified ve vehicle of expression of our thoughts. And it relies on very heavy, you know, inference um, of, of context, be it the you know, linguistic cues or non-linguistic cues in order to allow to reconstruct the underlying thought. So if, if language were thought, right, why is my thought so clear and my language so ambiguous? Now, one flavor of the communicative view is typically referred to as universalism. And the names best associated with this view are those of Jerry Fodor, Chomsky, and Pinker. Now, again, the founding idea uh, of this view is that thought is prior to language. Thought exists, and then we use language in order to convey the contents of our thoughts. So again, in this sense, language is purely communicative, typically interpersonal, although it could also be intrapersonal in, in a case where you, you talk to yourself, but it doesn't serve any cognitive purpose. And see, so the idea is that there exists a physical reality out there, for example, colors, and, um, and we develop concepts probably on the basis of our biology. So because our retina um, is sensitive to certain colors, we develop uh, certain concepts uh, of colors. Um, and then we might develop verbal labels in order to express those concepts. But the idea is that the perceptual categories, the colors that you recognize as different colors, those are hardwired in your visual system. Then we use language to capture these categories. You know, for example, the fact that we distinguish red from orange, from blue, from purple. Um, and, and these sort of these categories can be captured and, or ca can be synthesized into a verbal label, which makes it very easy for me to convey an idea about color to you. But, but, but again, language doesn't play any role in providing us these categories. We have the concepts we have, and we use language to convey those concepts. The backdrop of universalism is really mainly threefold. First, the idea that comes from Jerry Footer of the existence of a language of thought. And this is the idea that you know, our thought and thinking thinks, takes place in some kind of mental language, often referred to as a mentalese, uh, which is innate and compositional. So mentalese being a mental language that somewhat resembles um, um, a natural language, spoken language, and many key aspects. So for example, it's also made of, um, of symbols and the symbols can be combined into sequences. And, and each symbol has its meaning, but the way in which you combine uh, these symbols um, imparts uh, meaning to the overall structure, also known as compositionality of mental representations. But the idea, again, being that our, our, our minds come equipped into this world in order to generate thought and forethinking. So in the sense, we, we, we are predisposed to, to, to have symbolic thoughts. Uh, we don't need a language in order to achieve symbolic thought. So you might imagine that in our minds, you know, thought happens in this mentalese, um, and then we can map this thought from mentalese into natural language. Uh, but it's really almost a process of translation. There's no Again, there's no embedded um, a role for language, as in English or French, into mentalese. The second um, backdrop is the idea of Chomsky's transformational grammar. Really, broadly speaking, the idea that th there exists a process of translation from a, a mental representation, some sort of the, the meaning of a sentence, into the kind of sentences that we speak. So, and there's a translation sort of outwards. So for expression, where we go from, for, from uh, you know, a, sem a semantic construct in our mind of, of an idea of a mental representation into an actual spoken sentence for expression or vice versa, where a spoken sentence sort of can turn into a, a mental representation.
And, and finally, the third backdrop is really the understanding of language as being somewhat independent of other aspects of our mind, in, in, in the sense even modular, meaning that it's all encapsulated and does its own thing inside our human, inside the mind and the brain. And, and, and this comes both from Chomsky. So Chomsky uh, often refers to this as the language faculty. Um, and with the idea that in our brain, there's really a, a special part of the brain whose sole job is to listen for a tidbit of language, as we said last time, and, and on the basis of a modicum, a tiny bit of input, sort of figure out how our own language uh, works, maybe by setting uh, parameters under that view. Uh, and of course, there's all this neuropsychological data of Broca and Wernicke that does show that to a large extent, language is very modular in the human brain. And I have to say, a lot of neuroimaging data uh, to date really supports the idea that there are some, uh, that at least the sort of language is seen as, as a strictly speaking, really the ability to map um, uh, very specifically utterances onto meaning, uh, that comes uh, from some very specific parts of uh, the human brain. Uh, and then, of course, other parts of the human brain might, might play into things such as pragmatics or sort of, sort of broader type of inferences. But language itself might be modular in the human brain and exist in, in a very specific parts of our human brain. So ultimately, under universalism, the idea is that language has the property it has in order to allow expressing the thoughts we have. So thought comes with its own characteristics, possibly captured, for example, by the language, by Fodor's language of thought hypothesis. And, you know, and thought is compositional. And, and, and language derives its own characteristics from thought. So in the sense, language is secondary to thought. And thought, as I said earlier, is prior to language. The work of Piaget gives a different view to the communicative idea of language. And really it sees language development as the result of cognitive development. So in this sense, the causality is the other way around. You need, um, you need to have cognitive development and only as cognitive development occurs, language can too develop. Now in Piaget's work, there was a lot of emphasis um, and study of the way in which children would, would grow uh, systematically um, uh, through, through specific and sequential stages. And, and each stage was typically associated with the learning of different types of cognitive skills. Now, the one cognitive skill I want to focus on is that of object permanence, which is developed fairly early, fairly early on uh, in, the, in the development of cognitive skills. Object permanence relates to the idea, uh, or to the understanding rather, that when an object is no longer in sight, it doesn't cease existing. It's still there, it's just out of view. It hasn't disappeared. And this is something that children develop um, during the sensory motor stage. Now, what is interesting is that Tomazello and Ferrar leveraged the development of this cognitive skill to test whether indeed um, you need cognitive development um, before language development can occur, also known as the prerequisite model. Now, the, the general idea was to, uh, was to assess the understanding and use of verbs that e of words that e either referred to movement of object in sight something that a child should be able to understand whether they have object permanence or not. And uh, as compared to the use of uh, movement words, uh, object movement words that relate to non-visible movement. Uh, so just to give you a couple examples, you can see them marked here. A, a, a visible object movement is something like, you know, to, 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 to move or fall down or up. Whereas a non-visible, object movement is something like gone or find or, or, or more. So something that, that Im implies an object being 
elsewhere or, or a quantity or something being elsewhere and being existing, although being out of sight. And see, what was interesting is that what they noticed is that stage six children, so children who typically have acquired object permanence, now they could learn and produce both types of words. So they, they could learn and produce both visible object movement and non-visible object movement. On the other hand, stage five children uh, who typically have not yet acquired object permanence, now they could only learn and produce the visible um, object movement words. So, uh, and this um, being evidence in favor of the idea that before you can start using certain elements of your language, such as words that refer to movement, that refer to movement that is non-visible, so that refer to items that exist, even if not right in front of us, well, before you can learn to, use, to, to do that, you need to have understood that objects can exist out of sight. So you, you, you must have acquired object permanence. And so this kind of datum is at the basis of the so-called prerequisite model. The idea that you need certain cognitive skills before you can acquire certain linguistic skills. So in this sense, language depends on the development. The development of language depends on the development of cognition. So here, it's cognition that influences language, not the other way around.